Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. It's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I'm very happy that you just pointed to the very important question I'm trying to answer to you now, because we already started on talking on heparin. So my task was to uh, say something about the when and how. First of all, here are my disclosures. So the most important here, of course, that I'm a neurologist. Um, first thing I asked myself, and I would just quickly go through it, so when talking about the how and when, what is the evidence at all? You all know that we're talking about acute ischemic stroke patients now and that most of the studies were done in patients with AFib, not necessarily in patients with stroke. So what is the evidence? It's, it's tremendous because we go back to 1993 just very quickly, maybe a time point when some of you weren't born yet or haven't been, have not been in school yet, and we all know that in the EAF study there was this tremendous effect of, um, of warfarin against placebo with this great reduction in new embolic strokes of recurrence in these stroke patients we are talking about, in the subgroup patients. So what's the evidence from the DOAC trials? All of these trials included patients who, already, who also had a stroke. And there's sound data to suggest that all the dogs also reduced the risk of recurrence in patients that had a stroke. So what is all the dis discussion about then, the when and how? Well, it uh, appears very uh, interesting, or it is very interesting that most of these trials on the dogs did not include patients that had a very recent stroke. The RELI study did not include patients that had a stroke within 14 days. The Rocket AF trial did not include patients that had a stroke within the last 30 days. The Aristotle study did not include patients who had a stroke within the last seven days, and so on. And even the EFT study um, had the majority of the patients included within 14 days, but were allowed to include patients up to 90 days. Second row tells you the number of patients with strokes that were included in the trials. So for some reasons, they were very worried about including patients at a very early phase, in the very early phase after acute stroke. So this concern, of course, is, as mentioned before, because early initiation may exacerbate or cause hemorrhage transformation or even parenchymal hemorrhage, something we are very afraid of. But what do we know about early initiation? Is this a, uh, a, a relevant uh, concern we have? Uh, it's always two sides of the coin, isn't it? One side of the coin is the early risk, which is assumed to be very high, data dating back to the 80s, suggesting that a fit patients who had a stroke have a very high risk to have a recurrence in the early days, up to 1% per day. And on the other side, the fear to cause for hemorrhage, or hemorrhagic transformation, and we know that this would very much impair the prognosis of our stroke patients. There's only one randomized controlled trial which gives us data on very early initiation. Only this very small study on not, not yet 200 stroke patients with a very small stroke, you all know the NHSS, which is the score for stroke severity, Two is very little, not very much impaired, just a very small stroke, and the infarct volumes were very small too. They started in the median on day two, and their goal was to see how many new events there would be on MRI. So no clinical outcome, just surrogate marker. They compared rivaroxaban and warfarin and did not find a difference between these two, neither in new DWI lesions, so a surrogate marker for new stroke, nor for new bleeding on T2 star images on the MRI. So in this cohort of patients with strokes, small strokes, not severely impaired, it seemed to be safe from the point of view that there was no difference between rivaroxaban and warfarin. <coughs> All other data we have is data of cohorts, of prospective um, follow-up studies. And we do have, and this actually points to the question we just, we just had, we do have data on parenteral articulation, on heparin. And this data from this 
meta-analysis, which does not include, of course, those because it's from 2007, did, did tell us that there was not really a lot of data suggesting that we, that we should give heparins. Rather, it tended that there was no advantage at all to start with heparins. And when we look at the why, we see, again, there's the two sides of the coin. Yes, the heparins, the parenteral anticoagulants, did reduce recurrence with a significant odds ratio, or not nearly, nearly significant odds ratio, sorry, with a number needed to treat about 50, but on the other, on the other side, it did cause bleeding with a significant odds ratio and a number needed to harm of 55. So that was the reason, you know, the, the benefit you bought was paid by the disadvantage of the bleedings. So nearly all the guidelines say early administration of parenteral oral anticoagulation in a dose causing relevant blood thinning, not the dose of preventing deep vein thrombosis, is not supported because the net clinical benefit will be set off by the bleeding cause uh, in relation to the reduction in recurrence you gain. So this data was about heparins and warfarin. What do we know about the direct oral antagonists? So this is, again, data on the subgroup of the post-stroke patients. We all fear bleeding, of course. Oh, this, is, this is a slide I always get a awe from the audience when I show this little small. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And we fear, of course, intracranial bleeding. So, oh, I was, so what did the data show? The data showed the new oral antagonists are nearly all safer, all the doses less severe bleeding, less severe intracranial bleeding. So this would be an argument then that we are better off with a direct oral anticoagulants and might start earlier. So this would be an argument that we could start earlier with those as opposed to heparin. Um, and this assumption is always also supported by some observational studies we have, like the Swiss Nosis Samurai from Japan or the um, ref NOAC study, which all show a low intracranial bleeding risk with DOAX, including hemorrhagic transformation, if we start early. Um, this again is registry data, supporting the fact that we should not give low molecular weight heparins, and this data now includes also DOAX. The paper, or the, the graph I showed you earlier, was on um, patients that did not receive DOAX because they were not on the market yet. So basically supporting the assumption if we start with low molecular heparins in a high dose, this is not good for the patient as you see that low molecular weight heparins both cause more ischemic events or do not prevent more ischemic events as the yellow bar is higher than the green bar and do not and, and also cause more hemorrhages. Oh, yeah, I don't know if they go back. So, again, early administration of habits is not supported. Bridging is not supported. So, why does timing matter? The question was about the when. So, what do we know about the timing then? Okay, we know that in the large trials, there were very few patients that were included before day 14, just a few, but day 14 was the Epixaban study. So, why is that? Obviously, because Early start of oral anticoagulation is a predictor of parenchymal hemorrhage, although the data could be questioned because most analysis do not reach statistical significance. And because we already mentioned that before, parenchymal hemorrhage is a very strong predictor for bad outcome. So what do we know about the right time point? There is this analysis from stroke 2015, again, registry data, no control data, where they try to pick the best time span with both the lowest recurrence rate and the lowest hemorrhage rate. And in this analysis, just in multi-regression analysis, it was between day five and 13 that the patients were best off. So this is an argument just from registry data to start earlier than day 14, but not earlier than day four to three. Again, this is mainly patients with warfarin. 
just to stress that, of course, we have a heterogeneous group of different drugs. And this is the analysis supporting or suggesting that early start, but not too early, would be the best timing to go on with our interpolation. What do the guidelines say? We do have guidelines, and the guidelines actually give us hints. So, as I'm the neurologist, of course, first this joke guidelines, and they say, start at day four in mild stroke and small infarct, start at day seven in moderate stroke with medium infarct, and start at day 14 in severe stroke with large infarct. They also say, bottom line, based on observational study results, bridging therapy, that was the data I just showed you, is not supported prior to oral anticoagulation, must not be used in patients with AF and ischemic stroke. Strong evidence or strong, strong um, sentence. So here, they make the point, it's not only timing, it's also about the size. Or was a very interesting question to talk about size. And they say small, medium, large. They do not tell us what small, medium, and large actually means. They just say small, medium, and large, but they do not give us any definitions. I'm a bit clumsy here with the remote control, I'm sorry. So what do the cardiology guidelines say? The cardiology guidelines basically say the same thing. If you have a TIA, start straight away on the left. If you have a mild neurological deficit, small stroke, start after three days. If you have a moderate or if you have a moderate deficit, start after six to eight days. If you start uh, with a severe deficit, start after 12 to 14 days. But they somehow introduce an extra point to, be, uh, to have more data to, to build on. They tell us if you have a moderate or severe deficit, better make a second imaging and look at the second image and look whether there's any change to the infarct. So, same recommendation as the neurology, as the stroke recommendations, more or less, one, three, six, twelve. So you double the number, so to say, but very interesting, this recommendation made in the 2018 recommendations, based on the 2013 recommendations, they are basically the same, nearly the same, and those based on the warfarin data. So that did not somehow tell us that now they recommend something on DOAX, which was basically derived from data from warfarin, although we know that the drugs are different. Again, they give, a, they give us not a very good definition on uh, what minor, moderate, or severe means, so they improvise. And this is the only guideline that recommends repeat imaging. So does size matter? Yes, size does matter. Large lesions do predict parenchymal hemorrhage, and large lesions also do predict parenchymal hemorrhage in stroke patients with AF. And yes, it does. We do not want that this happens, a patient with a large right hemisphere stroke which has a parenchymal hemorrhage. So what will the future bring us? The future will bring us four more trials. One European, one British, one Swedish, and one Texan trial that all started with different um, assumptions and different sets to compare early and late initiation. So we will have more data to answer this question, um, but I cannot give any information on these trials apart from that they are actually happening at this moment. So what's the summary? What, the when, difficult question as there's only few data regarding the timing. Of course, very simple answer, it's a risk-benefit ratio. There's two sides of the coin, and we have to weigh benefits and risks. Um, as far as DOACs are concerned, it seems reasonable, safe, to start within 14 days and not later, although the trials did not include patients, or most of the trials did not include patients earlier than 14 days. Stroke size may help, 
but it is, it's a very individual judgment. We do not have um, a definition in terms of milliliters or in terms of what actually large means. The trials actually have, so the Elan trial, for example, has a suggestion where to find the cutoff. And we might just stick to the guidelines and choose our 13612 algorithm, although they did not differentiate between um, warfarin and doax. And how? Well, there's strong evidence not to bridge, um, especially when you're going for doax, because they have a very similar half-life anyway, so there's no advantage in terms of pharmacodynamics to first start with heparin and then start to doax. Um, neurologists actually start with aspirin, even if you have atrial fibrillation, and then switch to doax, because there's all this data about the bad, bad heparin, and I hope that very much in the future we will have new data to answer this very interesting question on early initiation. Thank you very much for your attention.